Hi, this is a tutorial for NASA's Eyes on the Earth software. So when you go to Eyes on the Earth, this is what you will see. And you can access this from any device with a web browser. You will go to climate.nasa.gov, and if you click on this icon here, it will take you to Eyes on the Earth. Or you can go to the Eyes homepage, which looks like this, at eyes.nasa.gov, and scroll down to Eyes on the Earth and click it. And it will open up in a new tab on any device, your mobile, tablet, laptop, desktop, any operating system, anything with a web browser and an internet connection, and you are good to go. So, when you open it up, this is what you'll see. You see Earth as it looked the day before, in this case, March 27th. Today is March 28th, 2023. And what we're looking at is a real-time 3D simulation of many of NASA's Earth science missions in orbit. And with this software, we can also map the data that the satellites take right back on Earth. So to start out with, let's see, let's click on satellites now. I'm going to go full screen here. So with satellites now, this is where they are right now this very second. So if you look around the globe, this is where each of these satellites is actually at. They are still moving quite quickly. But we're at one second per second right here. We can, of course, speed it up. Two minutes, five minutes per second. But that gets a little crazy. So let's go back to real time. And then anyone you want to see, you just click the label and in you go. So let's find the International Space Station. Here it is. It's on the dark side of Earth. So let me click on it. And you will zoom in to the 3D model. So there it is. There's the space station. You just click and drag and you can zoom in with your mouse wheel and have a look at it. This is a very, very interesting spacecraft, very popular. You can see there's other science missions on it, like EcoStress and EMIT and OCO3. Um, it's kind of hard to tell how big this is, so we have a little feature here called Compare Size. Let's put up a school bus and you can kind of get a picture of how big this thing is. So there you go. That's a school bus compared to the space station. So we've had astronauts on board for 20 plus years, and we do a lot of good science there. So you can learn about it here by expanding the label, and then we can go back to Earth as it is now. So not only can we see the models, we can see the data that they take. If you want to see any other mission, you go to the missions menu, and here are all the missions available in Eyes on the Earth. Each one will be connected to a data set if it has it, so, for example, GRACE follow-on, this is a very interesting mission that measures the fluctuating field of gravity itself, two spacecraft following each other. You can also click on the data it takes related right here. So that is a global map of the gravity field from November 2022. Where it's red, that means there's less weight or mass. Where it's purple, that means there's more weight or mass compared to a previous baseline. And then we can actually animate this data. So if we go back in time, let's, let's just do a few months here. So you can see the Amazon rainforest gets heavier with purple and lighter with red. And what that means is water and ice movement. So water and ice is the dominant factor that changes the gravitational field itself. So very, very, very interesting mission. And we monitor all kinds of vital signs, as we call them, of Earth. You can see shortcuts down here at the bottom. Let's just go to carbon monoxide, and we'll do it through the vital signs menu right here. So carbon monoxide is an indicator we get from fire. So you can look around the globe and see carbon monoxide concentrations at 18,000 feet in the atmosphere. Obviously, there was some fire over here, and we can go back in time and see where that came from. So if you go over here and click Animate This Data, you can see. So it's going to go back a week by default that may not be enough to see where it came from so let's go back even longer uh, let's go back to March 1st and go till now and see what happens let's see what March 1st looks like over there okay it looks like it was from sub-saharan Africa but I can show you one from California that was a pretty bad fire so let me show you the fires that burned down some of the sequoia forest in July of 2021. There's July 1st. You can just select your year, whatever you want here. I'll do the whole month of July and I can show you this fire visually and how the carbon monoxide traveled around the globe. So now we're back 
in July. And if you look right here at California, it's going to start up. These were very large fires that started, and they were so big that the carbon monoxide plume traveled in the atmosphere all the way across the Atlantic to Europe. Now, this is parts per billion, as you can see by the legend down here. Not parts per million, it's parts per billion. You can also see there's fires in sub-Saharan Africa, probably slash and burn agriculture. So this is a visual way to check out your home planet, see how it is doing. So let's go to surface temperature. This is a pretty simple one. What's the temperature globally? Anywhere I click, it'll tell me. That's Fahrenheit, but you can change it right here to Celsius. So this will be below zero, the freezing line. So the blue is actually zero degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you go around the globe, anywhere you click, you can see it. So India is pretty hot down there right now. And then, of course, the Himalayas are high elevation, so they're quite cold. And what's fun is to animate the data and watch the freezing line kind of move around. So this is just one week of animation. And you can see the, where the freezing line changes. So you can do this with all the data sets. And your choices are numerous. Uh, for example, we can go to soil moisture and salinity globally. We actually measure the moisture of soil all around the globe, as well as how salty is the ocean. So you can see soil moisture right now, where I am in California. It's pretty good because we've had a whole lot of rain recently. Normally, it's not like that. Likewise, you can see where there's low soil moisture in the Sahara. And then in the ocean, you can see very high salinity, like in the Mediterranean or the Red Sea. And what's kind of interesting is to see where the Amazon River lets out into the ocean. You can see it affecting the salinity of the mouth of the river. So it makes the ocean less salty there, but then it's more salty as you move off from the fresh water. And again, you can go back in time with all of this stuff, which is a lot of fun. And we also have events. We also have the latest events. Let's go to right now. What's happened in 2023? These are just the land events. You can pick fires, storms, ice, water. Let's do all types. So it's a busy year already. Uh, let's just check out something lately. Severe weather hits the south. So we'll map on some data right on top there and see what's going on here. So there are a lot of tornadoes recently in the southern United States. And so this is actual data about that and some information. And you can sort by any kind of event you want. Here's the latest one up here at the top. Uh, also, I want to show you a, a new feature we added. It's called ground tracks. So if you want to see how a satellite draws out the data, let's go over here to settings, turn on ground tracks, close it, and zoom out. And then you can see the line. You can see how fast the satellite draws a global image. So that's why we have three-day averages instead of one-day averages. So to take all this data beneath the satellite, that you might need two to three days for a global image. And you can see those lines drawn out here. You can fast forward, watch them go faster. Here's one hour per second, which is just about almost a full trip around the Earth. You can watch the lines draw up. All right, so that's ground tracks. And then finally, I want to show you a new feature. We've added videos, data animation, and graphics. So if you want to see a certain event as a movie, such as atmospheric rivers, you just click on it. This will show you a global map of high precipitation events in the atmosphere called atmospheric rivers. So this is from 2017 when we had a large amount of precipitation hit the western United States. But you can see them all over the globe. Here they are passing through the Atlantic. And then at the South Pole, you can see a lot of them moving around. So that's a fun video. You can also see certain charts of interest, such as global carbon dioxide. So here's carbon dioxide over 800,000 years. You can see it always went up and down, but it never crossed 300 parts per million. And now we are at 418 parts per million, only in the last 150 years or so. So charts like that are available to better understand your world. So that is Eyes on the Earth. Please check it out. Have fun.
How do we know Earth is changing? Have you ever looked at a picture of yourself from a few years ago and noticed how much you've changed? Maybe you grew a few inches taller, or maybe you have a different haircut. Scientists can use new and old pictures to keep track of Earth's changes over time, too. Since Earth is where we live, and it's the only planet we know of that we can live on, scientists are constantly observing its land, water, and air. By capturing images from the ground and images from satellites in the sky, we can see how our planet is different than it used to be. Natural phenomena, such as floods and volcanoes, can change Earth's appearance in a matter of days. For example, in summer 2020, heavy rains in West Africa caused intense floods on the Niger River. In these NASA satellite images of the region before the flood, you can see how a brown and dry region had become covered in shallow water and plants, such as grasses, just five months later. But heavy rain doesn't always help plants grow. In 2021, several days of heavy rain in Australia caused major problems. In the before image, you can see the green ground surrounding farms and homes nearby. A few days of heavy rain later, the river became blocked, flooding the area and causing farmers to lose their crops and livestock. Droughts, which are long periods of less rainfall than usual, also cause changes to our planet. In this satellite image from 2017, you can see many green areas surrounding Paraguay's capital city, Asuncion. However, this image of the same region in 2020 shows the effects of a widespread drought. Much of the lush green has turned brown and dry. Volcanoes are another natural phenomenon that can rapidly change the appearance of Earth's surface. Mount St. Helens is a volcano that had a large eruption in 1980. In this photo from 1984, you can see that the eruption destroyed a large part of the forest nearby. But in this image, from 2020, 40 years after the eruption, the region was showing many signs of recovery. Natural hazards aren't the only things that can change the look of Earth. Human activities can change what Earth looks like from space too. For example, within 50 years, Cancun, Mexico, transformed from a small town into a vacation destination for 2 million visitors per year. In this image, you can see the size of the city in 1985. In this photo of the same area from 2019, you can see that the city had grown significantly. However, while good for vacationers, this growth has brought problems for the environment, including water pollution and the washing away of beach sand. In this image from 1985, you can see the Paraguay Paraná River system in South America. This image from 2010 shows the same region after a dam had been constructed downstream to generate electricity. The flooding created by the dam caused many people to have to move. It also flooded a region that is the habitat of animals, such as jaguars, giant river otters, giant anteaters, and more than 650 species of birds. Scientists observing Earth have also noticed that Earth's climate is changing significantly and human activities, such as the gases released from power plants, factories, and car and truck exhaust, are the main driver of this change. Scientists are studying many signs of climate change, but one major effect we can see is the melting of glaciers. These are large, slow-moving rivers of ice on land. As the climate warms, these glaciers are disappearing. For example, in this photo you can see a huge glacier sat along the shoreline of Harris Bay in Alaska's Kenai Mountains, roughly 60 to 80 years ago. In this more recent photo, taken at the same location, you can see that much of the glacier has melted. To reach the glacier today, you'd have to travel miles up the valley beyond the fjords seen here. This 1941 photograph shows the lower parts of Muir Glacier and Riggs Glacier, both in Alaska. Back then, the two glaciers filled the entire inlet. However, in this photo from 2004, you can see that Muir Glacier melted, thinned, and retreated more than four miles. Comparing before and after images like these from the surface and from space is just one way we can keep track of changes occurring on our planet. Images from NASA satellites and scientists in the field are an important part of understanding how we can address those changes. 
Learn more about our changing planet at NASA Climate Kids. What is an aurora? An aurora looks like a beautiful display of lights in the sky. These are some auroras that were spotted in the sky over central Alaska. We can also see auroras from space. This is what an aurora looks like from the International Space Station. The name of an aurora changes depending on its location. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, it is called Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights. And if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, then it is called Aurora Australis, or Southern Lights. So, what causes these beautiful displays of lights anyway? The sun. That's right. Even though auroras are best seen at night, these colorful displays are caused by our ever-changing sun. How exactly does it work? Well, the sun is constantly sending heat and light to Earth. It also sends other kinds of energy and small electrified particles, too. This is called the solar wind. Earth has a magnetic field, which protects us from most solar winds, but it also traps some of the electrified particles in the space around Earth. The sun does not always send the same amount of energy. Sometimes the sun has huge outbursts and blasts more stuff into space than the usual solar wind. These events are called solar storms. During one kind of solar storm called a coronal mass ejection, the sun burps a massive bubble of gas that pops and sends particles and energy zooming through space. When a solar storm reaches Earth, it dances with our magnetic field, and some of the energy and particles that zip around the magnetic field dive into our atmosphere near the North and South Poles. The particles then bump into gases in our atmosphere. These interactions result in displays of light in the sky, auroras. When the particles bump into oxygen in our atmosphere, the reaction makes green and red light. When the particles bump into nitrogen in our atmosphere, it makes blue and purple light. Earth is not the only planet with auroras. If a planet has an atmosphere and a magnetic field, it probably has auroras. For example, NASA spacecraft have captured amazing auroras on Jupiter and Saturn. Learn more about our planet and our solar system at NASA Space Place. What causes sea level rise? If you've been to a beach before, you've probably noticed a sort of line where the ocean water meets the land. Of course, ocean water doesn't stay at the same level all the time. Waves and tides cause the level of the water to rise and sink all day long. But we can measure the height of ocean water many times a day and figure out the water's average or typical height. The average height of the ocean in a particular place is called the local sea level. But the ocean covers most of our planet, so it's way too big to measure with just a ruler. NASA measures the average sea level of the whole ocean from space. This measurement is called the global sea level. People have been measuring local sea level at certain locations along the coast for hundreds of years. And NASA has been measuring the global sea level for almost three decades. Over this time, scientists have observed that the global sea level has been rising. The ocean is about seven to eight inches higher now than it was a century ago. Why? Because Earth is getting warmer. Glaciers and ice sheets are large masses of ice that sit on land. As our planet warms, this ice melts and flows into the ocean. More water in the ocean makes the sea level rise higher. But that's not the only way seas are rising. As Earth warms, 
The ocean is warming too. Water expands as it gets warmer, so warm water takes up more room in the ocean, making sea levels higher. Rising sea levels can have an impact on how we live, especially in communities near the coasts. NASA and its partners use the Jason satellites to measure global sea level. It takes approximately 10 days for the satellites to complete one measurement. And after they finish one measurement, they start measuring all over again. By keeping an eye on Earth's oceans like this, we can measure how much sea level is rising and how quickly it is happening. Find out more about our planet at NASA Climate Kids. What is a nebula? This is a nebula. It may look like a colorful work of art, but it's really a giant cloud of dust and gas in space. Nebulae are far away from Earth. We know what they look like because scientists use powerful telescopes to capture images of them. A nebula can take many different forms and shapes. But where did these stunning dust clouds come from? Some nebulae come from the gas and dust thrown out when a dying star explodes. When a massive star explodes, it's called a supernova. This is an example of what that looks like. Other nebulae are regions where new stars are beginning to form, called star nurseries. How does a nebula make stars? Well, nebulae are made of very spread out dust particles and gases, mostly hydrogen and helium. Gravity begins to pull clumps of dust and gas together inside the nebula. Then, as those clumps grow larger, their gravity gets stronger and stronger. Eventually, a clump of dust and gas gets so big that it collapses from its own gravity. This collapse causes the material at the center of the cloud to heat up, causing the beginning of a star. The closest known nebula to Earth is approximately 700 light years away. It is called the Helix Nebula. The Helix Nebula is the remnant of a dying star like what will happen to our own sun in a few billion years. Using powerful space telescopes like NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope and Hubble Space Telescope, we have captured images of the Helix Nebula and many others. Scientists will learn more about nebulae with NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. It will be able to look through the dust to see stars forming planetary systems. Learning more about these faraway nebulae help us better understand the life cycle of stars, including our sun, the most important star to our life here on Earth. Learn more about our universe at NASA Space Place. <laughs>